Yeah. Okay, uh, good uh, afternoon. Uh, I'm Richard Yarwood uh, and I'm giving this presentation with not somebody virtual here, so any sort of uh, jerky movements or anything I have to ask Ken about. Ken Ringwood <laughs> and also Nicola Harm has helped with this project as well. And we've been looking at the uh, sort of changing role of, of local mountain rescue teams in sort of flood rescue and flood uh, resilience. Um, and that's the partners. We're also a university partner uh, and, and work very closely uh, with the university. Um, my day job is lecturing in, in geography here. I'm an associate uh, uh, professor here in geography, but I'm also a member of Dartmoor Search and Rescue Team Plymouth, which makes it doubly embarrassing if I ever get lost anywhere, being a geographer and a man, member of the Mountain Rescue Team. But I'm going to hand over to my colleague Ken Ringwood, who's a life member of the team, to tell you just a little bit about uh, what the team gets up to. Okay, uh, very briefly. Um, in 1968, the Dartmoor Rescue Group was formed. Um, in 2005, that was changed into four teams, and we're Dartmoor Search and Rescue Team Plymouth, which we think is the best one, obviously. Uh, the team is a charity with no direct um, government money, so we have to fundraise. One way is with partnership with the university. We go collecting outside supermarkets. We write travel guides and things like that. Um, our 40 rescue members are all unpaid volunteers with day jobs, or in my case, retired, which makes it a bit easier. Um, we have two dogs in the team, search dogs. We have some members who are qualified with um, search and rescue in water, swift water rescue, and we have some who are casualty carers. We are on call um, all day, every day, although we don't get called all day, every day, throughout the year. Um, in southwest Dartmoor, southwest Devon, Plymouth, and southeast Cornwall. And there is a map somewhere which shows... There we are. Oh, there we are. Which shows um, research by Richard between 2004 and 2011, and that the little lost and missing people on that shows you the sort of area. Occasionally we get called out to help other teams, and... Um, that's why there are some dots outside that area. Back to Richard. Okay, thank you. So a little bit of an introduction to the team. Now, we like to think of ourselves as, as sort of professional volunteers, although, as Ken said, we, we don't get paid for it. Um, we like to think we can work sort of shoulder to shoulder with, with the emergency services. And there's a good reason for that. It's because if the police uh, are called out to look for a missing person, they've got to ensure that that person is brought back safely and also that the people going out looking for that person are not going to put themselves in danger. It's all linked to uh, the Human Rights Act and a right to life. So the police must ensure that uh, mountain rescue teams, us and, and all the other teams on Dartmoor as well, uh, are up to a certain sort of standard. And that also includes the two dogs, really put up there for sort of cute dog pictures that people like to look at as well. But they are pets that work as well. So those are just uh, people's pets. That's Sunny, top left, the Labrador, Tui, the bottom right. Both pets that are trained to incredibly high standards to look for people. Now what's happened over recent years is that our team and also the other teams on Dartmoor as well have been moving into the area of sort of swift water rescue. And there's a number of reasons for doing that. First of all, um, evidence from the United States showed that things like river searches are the most dangerous uh, for teams to do. You know, you can fall in, you can get swept away. They're also the most dangerous for sort of walkers to cross. So there's a, a awareness that you can't just wander down a river, you need to think about your safety. But perhaps more significantly, and linked to the sort of themes of this conference, is that it's been shown, the literature has shown that we are undergoing climate change, that it's likely to lead to more extreme weather events. We've seen plenty in the southwest. You've just seen the picture of uh, Dawlish Warren, of course. Um, and there's a need to, to, to plan uh, a little bit better for that. Now, after one sort of set sort of flood, sets of floods in the mid-2000s, the Pitt Review was written that looked at uh, sort of resilience and the responses of the emergency services uh, to that. So there's been a need uh, to, to, to improve uh, responses uh, to swift water. Now, I'm a human geographer. I'm not a physical geographer. And I like to see floods in these ways as a multi-agency event, a multi-jurisdictional event, so it covers lots of different laws and so on, events that can bring in hazardous material, hazmat, and, and public health, uh, obviously, concerns as well, and also that they are quite long-term events that can actually exhaust the emergency services. So I'm looking at it a little bit in this way. How do these things come together uh, in, in a sort of flood situation? And it's interesting that in the Pitt Review, he noted that one of the first sort of responders to flooding were in fact voluntary services. 
things like mountain rescue teams, the RNLI, these sort of volunteers that actually make up a significant chunk of the emergency services in this country. And also I noticed that the cracking earth thing's got Australia in it, particularly in other countries as well. So what we're interested in looking at, we, we've very uh, kindly got some funding from the ISSR, one of their sort of uh, project funding. We started to look at, okay, well, you know, if I was sort of swept away, one of my members of family, can, you know, can we rely on volunteers? How do they fit in with the other things as well? So we had a few sort of research questions, looking at volunteer effectiveness, how can we improve that effectiveness, and how can teams be deployed? And although I'm partly doing this with the Mountain Rescue Badge on, what we were interested in doing was trying to get the opinions of those team members and those emergency services who work in swift water situations. And we did interviews with team members, or Nikki did, Nikki observed lots of training events, and we talked to members of uh, the, the, the emergency services, the, the professional full-time emergency services uh, as well. And I'll very, very briefly outline some of the things that we're sort of coming up with. So these are, we're not trying to evaluate and judge and, you know, whether a team's effective or not, it's really listening to the voices of those, those people involved in it. So the first thing, it's gone from this. This was an interview I did with a police officer a few years ago when I first started uh, researching and looking at the role of mountain rescue teams. And his words, I remember this, it was over in the, uh, the then canteen, Isaacs, you know, the mountain rescue team wants to paddle a canoe around on the reservoir and so they've got water rescue capacity, that's fine by me. All right, let them get on with it. You know, have them you know, splashing around. But I wouldn't call them out to a flood event because we need trained personnel. We need people doing the right job. So it's kind of gone from that, which I did about sort of seven years ago, to this, the comments from a uh, senior fire officer in Devon and, and Rescue saying the rescue teams now use the same standards we adhere to. They're completely aligned to the new level two. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. They're not fire standards, they're deferent rescue, uh, deferent concepts, okay? So in other words, a senior fire officer who does this uh, for real day in day out values the training that volunteers have to go through uh, and to be put in that situation. And this is a huge ask. Teams don't just sort of turn up and do it. We've, they have to sort of take in all kinds of different levels of technicians. It shows there what we call the cold, the warm, the hot zone. To go into the hot zone, you have to be what's called a level three water technician. You have to be able to swim defensively, aggressively, knows all kinds of, of, of rescue techniques. There are all kinds of things that can go wrong in a river. You, know, you can get trapped, you can get stopped, you can get swept away. Water is a constant force. It was always up against you, it's never going to tire. So you've got to undergo incredibly specific training for that that is done to national levels and has to be refreshed. If you want to work in the warm zone, okay, which is just that little bit back, back from the bank, um, you have to be a level two technician. And again, you can see that figure's got a, a personal flotation device on helmets, throw lines, the rest of it. The cold zone, which is where I'm going, you're not going to catch me near a river, um, is the, the rest of us providing backup. But to achieve these things, you've got to go incredible training uh, and meet national standards offered by DEFRIT. You've got to be able to do it at night in conditions like that. It was, in fact, a training exercise uh, we went and observed. That's a photo taken by Nikki. So you don't want, you know, you have to come up to particular standards, a particular kit that's all paid for by voluntary donation to come up to those levels. And as you can see, the fire brigade and the, the teams themselves are effective. There's ways that perhaps effectiveness could be improved. Um, again, this is perhaps a sort of summary of results talking to uh, volunteers who do it from the rescue teams, also the fire brigade as well. Certainly understanding of swift water is important. Um, the way a river moves, how stoppers, how weirs can create those hazards. They all have to go under some training and some awareness, but the fact is they're not sort of doing it day in and day out. So it's, it's that awareness to generate that. And the, the project originally had a, a geographer from Mahjong who specialises in this, how lay people understand rivers. Sadly, she moved to York, where they've got plenty of flooding as well, but we hope to look into that a little bit more. First aid, any specialist first aid. Um, all mountain rescue teams are first aid members, but maybe specialist training in water uh, sort of techniques, uh, you know, drownings and so on. Um, and of course, looking after teams themselves. There are reports of health hazards, lots of uh, upset stomachs from going into those rivers and how they're deployed. So that's from the rescuers themselves. And there's ways that, uh, you know, we can sort of uh, contribute towards that. The final thing is that we've had lots and lots of floods recently. Um, I think our team's been deployed once, um, and there's been reasons for that. You know, the last sort of couple of years of, of uh, very sort of heavy flooding, um, they're up there, they've got the kit, they're ready to go, they've got the qualifications, haven't necessarily been deployed yet. And there are reasons for that, is that perhaps um, sort of locally mountain rescue teams are, are new to this game, they're new to getting involved in swift water rescue, their capacities and their cap capabilities aren't maybe as known as they ought to be. And there's sort of three things that could be done to improve that. 
First of all, on a national level, apparently, it's quite a surprise to me, I think it's correct, uh, no agency apparently has a statutory responsibility for flood rescue. Obviously, the fire will get involved, the RNL will get involved, but I don't think it's a statutory responsibility that they've got. So that's obviously something that could be looked at in the future. Something else that happens that can get mountain rescue teams called out a lot more is being part of what's called something like the, the National Asset Register which is, a, funny enough, does what it says on the tin, a national register of various assets. So which teams have got boats, which teams have got so many technicians. The team can register on that, but then it's a huge ask. It means people being deployed away from their homes, from their works, for days, sometimes weeks, to remote parts of the country or different parts of the country, which uh, is quite a, a large ask. Volunteers may not want to do that, but they don't want to do that. There are only a small number of teams involved in that. But more significantly at the end, um, the reason why perhaps teams weren't being called out in local floods is that the local resilience forum did not know about them, okay, did not know about these sort of water capacities. And the local resilience forum are basically a group that get together and plan for events such as this. So despite sort of needing perhaps sort of better understandings of rivers and involved in that sort of technical training, there is a need perhaps just to improve the sort of local politics and the local partnership working in the team. That's a very brief introduction to, to some of the work that, that mountain rescue teams do and swift water and also some of the things we've been looking at. But I hope you found that interesting and to fit in with the themes of the conference. Thank you very much.